So the, the pieces of Los Angeles are looked at by many different people in many different ways. Um, Beacon Economics has been looking at this area for a while, including looking at it for the Otis Institute's California Creative Economy Study. I reached out to invite them to bring their conversations to the mix. So if we can please welcome Adam Fowler from Beacon Economics to come join us to share an economic view of the city. A uh, round of applause, please, while I pull up the slides. Thank you so much. I appreciate the invite. Um, this is a space we've been doing a lot of work in recently, and we have a kind of a young uh, millennial research staff that is really interested in the creative economy, especially as our workforce development efforts as a nation start to grapple with automation. Uh, the creative economy is a set of skills and competencies that aren't easily automated and offer a real uh, space for economic growth that's sustainable over the long term. So we come at it from a lot of angles. I'm briefly going to go over, normally when I talk about the local LA economy, I start at the national economy, work our way down to what's going on in California, and then get local. I'm going to skip through a lot of that, but I will say um, our national, our U.S. forecast model um, takes into account about 700 different time series variables. So uh, we are looking at indicators that lead to things like a recession is obviously bread and butter of what economists do, but also a whole host of other industry uh, dynamics at play. And so uh, at the top, um, when, I, when I shift over to some of the music-specific, creative-specific industry trends, I would put the backdrop that as of this year, we will have been in the longest economic expansion um, since we started calculating that number as a, as a U.S. government. Um, so a lot of industry trends uh, look upward, but uh, keep in mind that that's just the general kind of uh, jet stream of the economy pushing a lot of that. I do want to talk a little bit about, and I would direct you all um, to our uh, recently released Otis copy of uh, that report. Uh, it's a PDF online. This year, we this was our first year to work on that project, and we really kind of revamped the methodology. We reached out to people in the UK and Canada who had kind of updated the methodology um, in a way to bring into account a focus on the human beings involved. So a lot of times with uh, economists, the data sets are industry specific. And if you think about any private business, so I work in an economics firm, we're professional services in the data, but the mix of people and their skill sets and their occupations vary, right? You have accountants, you have graphic designers, you have all kinds of folks working in a firm. So the mix of occupations in industry data can often be misleading if you're trying to understand macro and local trends. So uh, we broke out this year for the first time, the mix of creative occupations and that definition is in the report, but we, uh, we did some mapping in terms of where that workforce lives in the county, uh, where the industries are located that they work. Um, of course, those things are not close together, especially as you move up and down the income, the household income ladder. Um, so some interesting LA specific uh, uh, items in there that I think would be of interest to a lot of folks here uh, as we start to uh, think more broadly. I'll, I'll come back to that in just a minute when we get uh, to some of the industry slides here. So briefly, I just wanted to go back to the 1990s, um, just because I don't get the opportunity to uh, a lot of times in the talks, and just look at how our industry dynamic here in LA County has shifted over time. The next, I'm not a big fan of tables, but the next slide, I'll uh, go through the table of how we've seen industry shift since the 1990s. You can see uh, kind of the Great Recession there in the middle, but both civilian employment, which takes into account public sector government employment, and then all industries there in the orange. And you can see coming out of the Great Recession, we've had a really strong uh, growth trajectory. Uh, both in government, we've begun to invest, uh, again, a lot of sequestration, uh, and other kinds of uh, austerity measures expired, and there was a, a bit of a robust hiring that was well overdue in a lot of public sector spaces. Um, the bottom line there, all industries here for the county as a whole. What's interesting, and I, um, uh, this is the top level, the industry codes are kind of aggregated up. You can get very granular, but this is a high level aggregation to understand over that 10 year period. If you look, um, the, the hand-wringing around manufacturing is borne out in the data, as you can see. Uh, we're right at, uh, that, I don't have the column label, but the manufacturing industry uh, down about 55%, about 450,000 jobs lost here in the county over that period of time. A lot of them around manufacturing in fashion, actually. So LA being the denim capital of the domestic United States, 
Uh, we saw a real shift um, in supply chains, uh, but some of that is beginning to come back as uh, the East Coast uh, fashion season begins to change, change as fast, fast fashion becomes uh, more important as sustainability measures become more important. Uh, a lot of disposable commodities uh, moving away is kind of the baseline brand. But I highlight motion picture and sound recording just because that's kind of the industry world we live in with the topic we're talking about today. And there's been a very robust growth, 45%. And one of the really time consuming things and that actually paid off for our research team is we uh, really did a lot of stakeholder outreach. So uh, if you think about like when the US census um, wants to roll in a new question, it's a very long and robust and timely process, and rightly so. And so that's the same with federal uh, statistics, whether it's the Bureau of Labor, the Bureau of Economic Affairs. So often when there's industry disruption, as we've seen broadly in motion picture, sound recording, the music industry with digitization, it takes a long time for those official statistics to catch up. So you miss a lot of folks that are actively participating in industries. And if you're looking just at the top level readouts, you can get a very confusing picture. So if you think about platforms that become producers, so Facebook might be listed as a software publisher, but then and again is becoming a producer and producing a billion dollars in content. The same for YouTube, the same for other platforms that might be in other industries. Another, another point uh, I would give a takeaway, and we, it's, you should read the report in terms of the mix of creative folks, music, sound, graphic design, that are now in industries that aren't traditionally labeled creative. So here in Los Angeles, I don't know, uh, I don't have a, a really a working hypothesis yet, but we're gonna look at other, other metros around the US to try to get a better understanding if this is a, a nationwide trend, but folks that are participating, creatives that are in traditional industries, so a graduate from an art school or a film school or a design, going into maybe a manufacturing, going into some industry that isn't, hasn't typically been uh, labeled creative. And so we're seeing quite a rise over uh, from 2005 to present day. And that's a real interesting trend in terms of how we think about where the creative footprint is, broadly speaking. Um, the other big item in the room that's worth highlighting and came up a lot in our stakeholder research and the, the rest of the panels today are really curated so wonderfully around issues that we heard over and over again around commercial real estate, around people being moved into these informal venues, both for housing and uh, for creative space. We heard time and time again during our stakeholder outreach, you know, the, the inability to access space for folks new in the creative industries and whether that's not being permitted in a warehouse somewhere or, you know, the inability to get into more uh, traditional studio, sound studio spaces. So with the advent of the streaming digital media, um, the LA Film and other folks are reporting out that our soundstage space here in the county is at 98% uh, occupancy and that those are contracts that go out a long time. So the ability of folks that may be doing an independent project or trying to access the space are really limited because the big players have uh, taken up all that space. The, the county is pushing to uh, kind of open up more space and streamline some of the permitting, but uh, a recent uh, sound studio uh, space that just opened up the first in a long time, it was a 10 year permitting process. So the problems around building affordable housing, micro units, all those also bleed over into our industry uh, issues. And so the inability to kind of uh, get our head around um, in migration, uh, growing economic uh, uh, footprint in the creative space is really giving us some trouble and it bleeds over to a lot of the issues that are uh, talked about later on. So for a lot of the stakeholders, actually we talked to the, the idea of um, some of the bills in the legislature around a 4 a.m. time weren't about being able to stay out and drink, but being able to access places that close at 10 p.m. So like, <laughs> I always joke that whether it's housing for yourself in real estate or um, in industry participation, the rich tend to win. So if you know there is an affordable housing, the rich can outbid you. And it's the same for any sort of creative space. If the, if the venue closes and sits vacant from 8 p.m. until 9 a.m., um, that's an opportunity that a lot of young creative folks uh, just now getting in the workforce were really interested in. We think provides a real opportunity for growth. A lot of other cities, we uh, did a lot of outreach to the mayor's office in New York, are really starting to prioritize the music industry and preserving spaces where uh, middle income uh, and lower income participants can enter that uh, workforce. So housing is a big part of the story. It's a big part of our growth overall. We can, we've been growing. California coming out of the Great Recession has been a driver 
uh, nationwide. You know, if you tune into Fox News or other places, you think California is killing all business and people are fleeing to wherever. That's just simply not been the case. We have been the driver coming out of the Great Recession for all the states in the United States and continue to be. Now, the problem with that is we've been adding jobs at a really nice clip but we've not been adding beds for those jobs or housing for those jobs. And we have a real crisis that is gonna constrain future growth. What's good, and I think for the economist, I'm not an economist by trade, I generally say more of a social scientist, but I think what's good for the traditional economists at our firm is that some of those economic theories are actually finally uh, beginning to show um, some traction. So household incomes have been increasing since um, the, the coming out of the Great Recession, which is really quite wonderful. That's good to see that the household incomes are beginning to creep up. Now, what is the, what's problematic, and I didn't have time today to talk about, but you can kind of see over on the right-hand side, uh, that figure is getting at our migration problem. So if I take the state as a whole and um, bucket uh, household income by category, um, under 100,000, we've generally had a net out migration. So we've been driving families under 100,000 out. We've been bringing um, jobs, occupations, households over 100,000 in. So uh, we always flag as an important kind of proxy that when we want to work on affordability issues, um, the word affordability is kind of misleading. Uh, we, I, I keep up with kind of the San Francisco Bay Area, and because they're forcing poor families out of the state, um, the affordability crisis as defined by the percentage of income you're paying on housing looks to be resolving itself in the data, right? but that's because the underlying dynamics are wealthier people coming in, poorer people going out. So it looks like your area median income is on the rise, but um, broadly speaking from a kind of societal point of view, that isn't a good dynamic and that's not how we actually want to solve the problem, I wouldn't think. It's, I mean, it is a normative question for us, but I, I would go out on a limb to say that's not how we want to solve affordability. Um, so that's an important thing to keep in mind uh, as this conversation goes on. I'll quickly go through uh, music employment, both by industry and occupation. What's really exciting about this and other creative industries is there's a real spillover effect. So uh, a medium and uh, content are really uh, melding. So music videos have become uh, Snapchat content, have become podcasts, have become all the things. Um, and we're really seeing that across our industry uh, verticals. So software publishers are now in the content business and that's important because the people that are trained in, with a specific skill set, whether that's film or music, those folks can participate in a lot of uh, different spaces and participate in places they might not have in the past. Snapchat is a great example with some of their incubation and workforce development around uh, disadvantaged uh, young children around their area where they bring them in and open up the opportunity. They're learning lighting, they're learning all the things the screen, the, the way we view it may be a little different, but you're learning a set of competencies that maps really nicely on to other uh, career ladders. Um, so we're very excited about the, the content and the kind of um, explosion around content in that it really gives a nice workforce development pathway for our people. It's also um, a, a really a, a, an opportunity, a market opportunity. So as diverse voices, as diverse content really become a market advantage to private industry, our workforce, our people here in Los Angeles are already looking like the global marketplace. So people, you know, it's really one of the advantages. There are a lot of states that have offered tax credits around all sorts of things. Uh, the problem is there's not a, a workforce there like there is here in Los Angeles. So, you know, if your sound, uh, your sound team is in a car accident in Georgia, it takes three or four days to replace them. Here there is a real strong, robust pipeline of folks. And so it's a real market advantage as uh, content becomes global. And we're really excited about that. That being said, and again, uh, applauding some of the panels later in the day, we've not done a very good job pub in, in terms of our public sector advertising how you get in to the industry. So if you look at Toronto, if you look at uh, the UK, there's a very robust, easily accessible, easily understandable set of uh, offerings that are in a, in a centralized place. Um, a ton of Canadian cities do a really good job. Do you want to publish a book? Do you want to uh, do your own zine? Do you want to uh, do podcasts? All of that is in one place. Here, if you, uh, I would challenge anyone to Google a set of kind of keywords. You, you get uh, routed to the film permitting office, as if for a young person that's 
the, the door you want to open, some sort of like very bureaucratic process. Other, other jurisdictions do a lot better. Uh, London, and people are hungry for it. A lot of people are now uh, the, the, the UN and the creative uh, cultural uh, division of the UN just had a recent conference where we're not the only ones that see the value in this industry. And the idea of resting on our laurels during a period of disruption is really going to be problematic. Um, so the idea that we don't approve space for sound recording studios, other jurisdictions will, and people will follow if we really uh, close off access. So <clears throat> this is one set of industry data. As I mentioned, industry data can be misleading, uh, but this is really robust in terms of the industry employment in those formal industries. Uh, we've got record production distribution in purple, uh, sound recording studios. I double checked and because <laughs> I, was, I was like that, that time series seems a little wonky, but that's correct. Uh, we've lost some of our uh, sound recording studios. Those were real things that I was able to kind of triangulate against uh, anecdotal news, news um, uh, documentation. Uh, musical groups and artists there at the top, um, other sound recording industries, music publishers um, there. So uh, really quite um, coming out of, you know, if you think about uh, really getting our legs back from under us in 2010 as the mortgage crisis kind of uh, came to a, a conclusion and we started to pick back up a little bit, really un, unfazed. And that's in part because of the global consumer demand around a lot of these industries and new opportunities for folks to participate. Um, annualized wages, again, we've seen uh, relatively nice growth here. The one thing I would flag and just didn't have time for today is that a lot of folks in the creative industries are self-employed or in, in uh, economics parlance in the non-employer statistics data set. And that data set is not as robust, it's a census product. Uh, but again, we've seen um, an uptick in, in wages around the self-employed as well. So both opportunity and formal kind of W-2 employment and an uptick in the revenues that self-employed uh, uh, 1099 folks that are more freelance are being able to enjoy as well. So that's very exciting. Uh, people are getting an opportunity to participate. And in part, that's because the market is demanding a really diverse set of folks uh, with different backgrounds. Um, again, uh, the industries and employment in Los Angeles. So we did music and kind of music adjacent. Uh, musicians, singers. Uh, we really haven't seen a lot of movement, which is actually good compared to other <laughs> industries over this period of time. So a net win, but uh, radio, television announcers, sound engineering technicians, audio and video equipment technicians. Um, I, we did three points in time there. And as you can see, uh, really pretty strong, not any sort of radical change. Those folks, while uh, his, historical industries may be uh, uh, beginning to shift and change, they're able to plug in that set of skills and underlying traits and credentials and competencies into other opportunities. Uh, that's what's uh, really quite wonderful about the skill set. It's not an investment in kind of a a job that is going to be um, outsourced or automated. It's really a robust set of things here on the ground that um, people can plug in and into a lot of different ways. Um, two minutes, I will quickly zip ahead <laughs> as usual. Sorry, I'm long-winded on uh, my TAing days. The VC capital has been very exciting in Los Angeles. Um, this is a very expensive data set we subscribe to, but movies, music, entertainment, there's been a lot of tech-enabled uh, investment in venture capital here in Los Angeles County, um, and that has taken a lot of shapes. Um, but this is a really robust portfolio. It's laughable. I have a slide in another presentation where I have screenshots of, I think, 2005, 2006, where there was this faux dynamic of NorCal versus SoCal, creative versus tech, and we're all married now. But if you'd go back in time on LexisNexis and look at the kind of dynamic uh, back in the early 2000s, it was quite laughable to think about our two worlds being at odds. They're now one and the same, and we see value in each other. Um, as I mentioned here, deal count, um, capital raised. Uh, there are a lot of interesting funding vehicles. You're actually seeing more institutionalized sponsors get into this space. Um, you're seeing actually something very similar with clean tech and clean energy, where it, you know, the risky venture capitalists throwing money into something. You're actually seeing more uh, standard institutional investors begin to participate, and that's exciting because they see the risk is being less, and there's a more robust portfolio of assets out there. So um, while this may look like it's uh, plateaued or down, down a little bit, um, their institutional investment has taken its place, and that's exciting. So not anything to be fussed about there. I'll quickly go through. There's been some really neat and interesting new entrants. 
um, in adjacent industries. Again, the idea that the tech-enabled ecosystem is allowing folks to participate in a lot of new ways. Um, I will go ahead and skip ahead. Um, incubators, I, again, I think that that's on later today, but um, our ability to kind of ramp up in that space, public-private, public investment in the folks that are interested in uh, starting a career ladder is really important, and we really need to uh, really think and bring folks together. I know um, in California we've got a weird governing system where it's hard to kind of wrangle the cats compared to other jurisdictions, but we really need to work across jurisdictional boundaries to make sure people that come here looking for that opportunity are able to access it. Finally, to show that I'm still hip and not a boring economist, I had uh, my team pull some albums that were recorded in uh, uh, some of the big billboard hits. Um, we've got work going on here that is very much marketable, and this isn't um, just kind of all off the grid new stuff. We're still doing some of the old bread and butter and a kind of cool list of folks going on here. So with that, I will stop. I don't. Close, Thank you.